Well, good morning, everybody, and uh, thanks for being here. We're here today to talk about the pensions of approximately 3,300 uh, workers in the federal nuclear industry who work for Canadian nuclear laboratories. Um, and I'm joined today by Debbie Davio, the uh, national president for uh, PIPSI, Jonathan Fitzpatrick, who's the local president for uh, CNL workers in Chalk River, and Steve Schumann, who's with the International Union of Operating Engineers, who also represent uh, workers at the, uh, at, the, at the Chalk River site. And of course, I'm a I'm here in my capacity as an NDP MP, but I'm also a proud member of the IBEW who also represents uh, workers in the federal nuclear industry. We're here to talk about uh, workers who pension, whose pensions were put on the line when the Harper government made a decision to privatize the assets of AECL. And at that time, workers were told that they had three years and then they'd be booted out of their uh, pension plan. And as many people know, uh, working in the nuclear industry is, is not, it's, it's not an easy gig. It comes with a lot of risks, and people get into that line of work, which involves a lot of training uh, and high skills workers in, in order to be able to provide for their families and to know that at the end of it, they're going to have a good pension. Now those workers are staring down being kicked out of their pension in uh, September. And they're staring that down with a government who's promised to be a friend to the middle class and to working people and, and to protect pensions. But it's also a government that, on the other hand, presented uh, legislation that would be damaging to Canadian workers' pensions across the country, Bill C-27. It's also a government that has taken no action when it comes to, to the kind of pension theft we've seen in the cases of large bankruptcies, like what's happened with Sears workers. And now it's a government that's uh, being called once again to test the resolve when it comes to Canadian uh, pensions and uh, defending the pensions of Canadian workers with, uh, with these workers at Canadian Nuclear Laboratories. So we're here today because we're going to be delivering these letters. There's literally thousands of letters that are going to be going to the Prime Minister, the President of the Treasury Board, among others, uh, calling on the government to help these workers save their pension and to keep them in the public service pension plan as they continue to do work for the federal government and manage Canada's nuclear assets. There's an important moral reason for doing this because these workers were promised a good pension at the end of their, at the end of their career. They've been paying into it. But there's also operational reasons for doing that. These are the workers that, uh, these workers, as I say, got into the industry in order to be able to provide for their families and to have a decent pension. And by being kicked out of the plan, it's causing some of those workers to look for work elsewhere or to consider an early retirement. Now, I'm from Manitoba, and, and uh, the uh, Pinawa site is on the cusp of decommissioning. And a lot of the workers there have specific site knowledge that would be very useful and important in that decommissioning process. Forcing them into an early retirement or to look for work elsewhere at this juncture is not a smart decision. So we're here to send that message, and I'm going to pass it on now to uh, PIPSI National President Debbie Davio to uh, speak on behalf of her members. Thanks, Debbie. Thanks, Daniel. My name is Debbie Davio, and I'm president of the Professional Institute of the Public Service of Canada. We represent some 57,000 professionals across Canada's public sector, including almost 700 of the thousands of nuclear workers at the Chalk River facility. I'm here today to deliver a clear message to the government, a message on behalf of thousands of CNL employees who have written to their elected officials, give us back our pensions. Let us focus on doing our jobs in the service of Canadians. It wasn't fair that highly skilled professionals were removed from their pension plan by the Harper government. Harper nixed it, but Trudeau can still fix it. The eligibility of CNL employees, Canada's nuclear workers, needs to be re-examined with the aim of, at allowing them to participate in the public sector pension plan. It's the right thing to do. It's the smart thing to do. It's the only choice to make in defense of Canada's nuclear professionals. Thank you for your time and attention today. And now we'll hear from Jonathan Fitzpatrick, the uh, PIPSI local president for Chalk River. My name is Jonathan Fitzpatrick. I'm the president of the Chalk River Professional Employees Group. I am here today representing my colleagues and co-workers at Canadian Nuclear Laboratories. In 2013, the Conservative government announced its intention to implement a government-owned, contractor-operated model for the management of AACL's nuclear laboratories. 
where the Canadian government retains ownership of the assets, is the primary customer of services, and continues to fund the construction of new facilities and infrastructure. This was a first of its kind for Canada, but part of this new model also included removing employees from the Public Service Pension Plan. AECL has a long history of delivering world-class nuclear science and technology for the benefit of Canadians and the world. AECL, on behalf of the Government of Canada, recently announced an additional investment of $1.2 billion into new infrastructure at Chalk River. The government also needs to maintain its investment in CNL employees now and into the future. This Liberal government campaigned on supporting the middle class by not taking action to put CNL employees back into the Public Service Pension Plan. The Liberals are instead fulfilling the mandate from the previous Conservative government. CNL is Canada's nuclear science and technology future. We are asking the government to protect our pensions. We aren't asking for anything new. We are simply asking the government to maintain status quo. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jonathan. And last but not least, we'll hear from Steve Schumann uh, from the International Union of Operating Engineers. Good morning. As, as Daniel said, my name is Stephen Schumann. I'm also the co-chair of the Canadian Alliance of Nuclear Workers. We represent uh, over 13 uh, different bargaining units, uh, including PIPs and some others, including operating engineers and IBW. We have been lobbying the, this government since their inception of the power, so over the past three years. Uh, we've had support among members of parliament, both Liberal, NDP and Conservative, who all agree that this was a bad decision made by the previous government. We've had many meetings with uh, the various ministries and departments. There's been some willingness within ministers' offices. Our biggest challenge, though, becomes within the Treasury Board Secretariat officials who helped create and design this, this new GOCO model. There, there's a fear that they're going to be changing a precedence. Well, there is no precedence for this anywhere in the world in Canada. This is first of its kind. It's based on the model in the UK. In the UK, the public service sector employees remain in, as such with the government, as government employees. So if the Canadian government really wants to copy and emulate what was done in the UK, they should do so, allow us to remain in the, in the public service pension plan, sit down and work with us to make the best model. And if the government wants to use this GOCO model going forward, let's make sure it's the best model. There's some concerns around cost. We've had actuaries who have determined that this is a very small cost to keep us in the pension plan. Again, though, officials refused to do their own cost analysis until Daniel Blakely actually pushed it as a question to the minister. The bureaucracy has been stonewalling, we believe, the members of parliament and minister's office on this. We believe there are many options that can solve this solution, and we ask the government to actually listen to some of the options we've suggested, sit down with us, talk to us, and actually find a solution. Thank you very much. Are there any uh, questions, either for myself or some of the workers' representatives that are with us today? That's right, yeah. So uh, that's my understanding is that uh, essentially on a go forward basis, employees won't be able to continue contributing to their plan. So for some workers, that means they may, they may be 10 or 12 years into that plan, uh, which is part of the basis for having a career in the uh, nuclear industry, and they won't any longer be able to contribute to that plan, which means they won't make it to a full pension. So I've heard from workers in, uh, in, in Manitoba who are saying, you know, for me, that means looking for work elsewhere because the reason I got into the industry was, was, was for the pay and for the benefits. And if, uh, if CNL isn't going to provide that, then they're going to go put their skills to work somewhere else. For other workers who are maybe 20 years in, uh, who were looking to round out their pension, it means maybe taking an early retirement because staying with CNL doesn't mean uh, topping up their uh, pension any longer. Uh, in Manitoba, that would be like the Pinawa facility? That's or? right. Yeah, it would be workers in uh, Pinawa. And what's interesting about the Pinawa example, and, and one of the, re I mean, I think there's an important moral reason for government to back up the uh, pension promise, and that's not to be understated. But from a logistics point of view in Pinawa, as you know, we're on the, we're on the cusp of decommissioning that site. So what that means is that, you know, workers that, that have site-specific knowledge that's going to be important in the decommissioning process are now looking at either working somewhere else or retiring early, and that, that means that uh, CNL is going to lose 
an important part of that site-specific knowledge that can't be replaced uh, as, as a result of this decision. Um, maybe some of the representatives here are familiar with like the um, the labor market for people who work mm -hmm. in nuclear. Like, is it a captive market? Is it um, easy to find people with this, or are people kind of stuck in these jobs but won't have a pension? It's hard to hear the question. I'm yeah. sorry. Sure. So I'm just kind of trying to figure out like the market for um, labor when it comes to uh, nuclear workers. Like, are there a lot of nuclear workers? Is it easy for the uh, CNL to find other people, or is it more like it's so specialized that people can't really move around that much? Yeah. So the the nuclear uh, labor market is pretty limited. Um, there are you know specific sites. So between the power reactors, the research reactors. Um, there is a very limited pool of, of, highly, of these highly skilled nuclear workers. The other factor that uh, works against us in terms of attracting new people is the, the remoteness of the locations, both at Pinawa and at Chalk River, um, and lack of other uh, employment opportunities in the area for these you know, good-paying, high-skilled high jobs other than, other than the laboratories. So, for example, if you're uh, two, two people looking for two-income uh, in the area, the, the, there is limited availability of additional other uh, employment in the area. Daniel, like, what, what does that look like in Penawa then? If, if there's this change to the labor market, this is a town that kind of relies on nuclear. It's made a decision to go even further with that in recent years. Yeah, I mean, I don't think it's any secret that the decommissioning of that site is going to be hard on the town of Pinawa. I know, you know, Pinawa has been doing work for for years now in terms of trying to imagine what what the future of the of the town looks like. But my point for today is that in order to have a safe decommissioning process, it's important to retain the workers that have been there, so that they can be part of that process and the site specific knowledge that they have informs what CNL does. I mean, there's not to get off topic, but I mean, there, it has been controversial in terms of the change of plan for how, how the government intends to decommission uh, Pinawa, because instead of, instead of disassembling and transferring the waste to a secure storage facility, they're now talking about essentially grouting it in, in uh, place. And there are, there are people that are rightfully concerned, including me, I've raised this in the House before about this new process. Um, so the, the, uh, Private contractors that were brought in with CNL are already changing the plan. They're changing it because of cost considerations. I think it would be a shame if they were moving ahead with a process that might already be cutting corners and then doing that in the absence of the workers that have been there for a long time and actually know the details of the uh, site and uh, things that somebody coming from outside couldn't possibly know. The decision to kick these workers out of their pension plan makes it more likely uh, that those workers are either going to leave for other opportunities or or retire early. Um, and uh, I don't think that's good for the decommissioning uh, process either. It's not good for the workers and it's not good for Manitobans and ultimately Canadians. And uh, I'd just like to put this in the context of Sears. Do you see any kind of a parallel with this? We've got one case where the pension plan kind of you know, went to the execs. You've got another one where people are weaseling out of the pension plan. Are you seeing... Are those two linked? Is there a pattern here, or are those just totally separate? The mechanics here are very different, but the principle is the same, which is that we have a government that said they were going to stand up for the middle class, and that they understand the value of a pension, and every time they're tested, every time that they could actually stand up and do something for real people's pensions that would make a difference in the life of real people, they take a pass. So that's the overwhelming similarity, I would say, between these things, and we're hoping to change that pattern here today. That's why we've got these thousands of letters we're going to be delivering. That's what, you know, Steve uh, talked about the fact that uh, the unions representing these workers have been meeting with the government essentially for the last three years, ever since they came to uh, power, uh, and, and we're hoping that we can get them to finally live up to the, to the, to the rhetoric that they give us on pensions, uh, because this is the, this is the live of, these are the lives of over 3,000 workers and their families and their communities. So the reason we talk about pensions, the reason we use those words, is because living up to them can make a difference for real people in real communities across Canada, and the time to act on that is now. So this is, uh, this is a test for the government. One last point, if I can just circle back to some of the union representatives. I'm curious about the discussions you've had over the past three years. Uh, like, how often have you met? Has it been meeting? Has it been teleconferencing? And, 
has has the messaging kind of been consistent or so individual unions we've been meeting since over the three years and the two years ago we formed this alliance the Canadian Alliance of Nuclear Workers uh, we had a day on the hill where we met with uh, members from the various committees that would be impacted by NRK and Treasury Board we have met with Mr. Carr's office PMO and Treasury Board Minister's office uh, probably half a dozen times each to, ra to raise our concerns uh, you know, we've made traction with a couple offices, but uh, one of the things which I touched on, we have, we did a cost analysis through an actuary who, who who we supplied to the government. The government took over probably nearly probably a year to respond to to give us when we haven't seen it yet, their their financial response. We have we we've got an estimate about three million, was it, Jonathan? Uh, about three million, about less than three million to keep the people in the public service pension plan. The government said that they had a different number. We've still not we still don't know what that number is. We have an estimate. Of roughly what it is, but until Daniel raised a question to the minister, the answer still has not been shared with us, so we don't know what the actual cost is. Uh, we hope to uh, meet again with Mr. Bryson. Actually, the president of the Canadian Labour Congress, Hassan Youssef, has stepped in now as well. He has met with uh, Mr. Carr and is trying to meet with Mr. Bryson to find a solution to this. So it has gone to the, large, the, large, the highest level of the Canadian Labour Congress. So it, everyone deems this is a very important matter and also a very precedent matter. Depending how you treat the unions in this bargaining unit, if we remain out, what other models may the government bring forward to this? So it is very important for us to uh, fix this solution in a positive way. And as Daniel said, if the government is serious about pension plans, middle class, they will find uh, a solution to help us stay in the pension plan. Thank you, everybody. Appreciate it.